All right, so if you've been watching my channel for a while, you've seen me criticize Disney leadership quite a lot. I've created entire videos highlighting the issues with their underwhelming hotels, lazily put together entertainment, or this nauseating need to slap an intellectual property into inappropriate areas with what usually amounts to pretty poor attractions. I've also discussed the many anti-consumer policies, continuing to cut everything to the bare minimum, whether it be staffing, entertainment, or hotel perks. All the while, they have the audacity to continue charging more while offering less. Even offering their new skip-the-line system called Disney Genie Plus, which by all accounts, isn't great. And so, because I highlighted these many issues and made the statement that Seven Dwarfs Mine Train is a waste of space, and I'm not wrong, People have decided that I am a so-called universal shill because I've made the case that Universal Parks have been improving dramatically over the last few years and that this will spell trouble for Disney as their brand and experience continues to decline. So not that I really need to justify myself to people who will continue defending Disney's pivot towards the Six Flags experience, but I do think it is only fair that I point out the many issues that keep Universal Parks from really blossoming. Today, I'm going to be covering various areas, such as the over-reliance on screen technology, and how this leads to an underwhelming attraction experience. Another major aspect I would like to cover is the many lands and attractions of these parks that almost feel, well, abandoned and forgotten. And to top all of this off, I will also express a number of other miscellaneous concerns about what's holding these parks back from the greatness that they could potentially achieve. So, join me today as we take a critical look at the Universal Parks, breaking down the many issues found within. Just a quick favor from anyone who's watching, but I've discovered that if I just simply ask people to leave a like on the video, it tends to do a lot better. So if you want to support this type of content, that's an easy way to do so. If you haven't subscribed already, you can do so as well if you'd like. Right, so if we're going to highlight the issues of Universal Parks, the first place we're going to start is, well, obviously, the over-reliance on screen-based attractions. Universal Studios Florida itself offers a whopping four simulator attractions in just one park, which is going to include Despicable Me Minion Mayhem, Race Through New York with Jimmy Fallon, The Simpsons Ride, and Shrek 4D, which at the very least will be closing on January 10th, 2022. However, in addition to these, the park also offers other 3D-based experiences such as Transformers The Ride 3D, Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts, the Hogwarts Express, and of course the infamously bad Fast and Furious Supercharged. These, in addition to the amazing adventures of Spider-Man and Skull Island Reign of Kong, leaves Universal Orlando with 10 major attractions across both parks that rely more on screen technology than physical sets and animatronics. So why is this the case, and what makes screen-based attractions so detrimental to the theme park experience? Well, in my opinion, the best attraction out of all of these listed is The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man. When it opens with Islands of Adventure in 1999, it absolutely was a groundbreaking attraction, in that it took the sets of a more traditional dark ride and blended in screen technology to put riders right into a series of action scenes. In conjunction with ride vehicles that simulated convincing movement and a number of impressive effects scattered throughout, this attraction revolutionized the theme park industry with how unique it was, at least for its time. However, Universal Parks would struggle with attendance throughout the Audis, until the premiere of Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey with The Wizarding World in 2010. Again, incorporating screen technology to portray action, but mixed in with physical sets, and this time, actual figures and animatronics. After this though, Universal very much lost its way aiming to revitalize the struggling Universal Studios Florida by incorporating more cheaply built and easily updatable screen-based attractions that revolved around the integration of IP. Obviously, I've criticized Disney quite a bit for doing the same thing, but where do you think they got the idea from? With that being said though, I do at least understand why these attractions did improve attendance at the parks. Minions is popular with kids, 
and reused the simulator that's been in the building since 1990, when the park first opened, having most recently replaced Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast. Transformers is a decently entertaining attraction, and Escape from Gringotts, while not my favorite, does what it can with limited space. I know that Gringotts is intended to be the e-ticket of Diagon Alley, but really, Diagon is the major attraction, with Gringotts being a supplemental experience. Even Race Through New York is a decent attraction, I believe, but its issue is that it exists in a park oversaturated with other simulators and screen-based experiences. I don't even really believe that screens are really the primary problem, though, so much as it is three specific attractions. The extremely outdated Shrek 4D and The Simpsons, and the laughably bad Fast and Furious. However, while I do think that most of the screen-based experiences are acceptable and have even grown on me over time, they still oftentimes fail to live up to more traditional dark rides. If we go back to any classic dark ride, whether it be at Disney, Universal, or any other park, the physicality of an attraction will always have a stronger sense of atmosphere within the ride portion itself, as long as it's executed well. Gringotts manages to achieve strong atmosphere through its queue, but the scenes themselves tend to blend together after the drop track. I also know that I just stated that Gringotts is constrained by its limited space, but I feel that it could have been executed just a little bit better. For example, a fantastic dark ride is Dreamflight, located at Efteling. It consists of a series of fantastical scenes with no story to tie them together, but the point of the ride is the excellency of the set design and atmosphere. One thing that I really like is how the attraction uses dioramas to invoke forced perspective, which seems like the perfect way to flesh out Gringotts. For example, a diorama of the underground caverns could give the ride more physicality and depth, putting a translucent screen in front of it to portray the action. Another issue with screen-based attractions that a lot of people don't seem to acknowledge is not the screens themselves, but rather the execution of the narrative. Let me ask you this. What is the difference between Jaws and the amazing adventures of Spider-Man in this regard? Both attractions focus on putting you right into the action, but Jaws and the many other attractions that defined early Universal Studios Florida had to maintain a slower pace because of the many moving set pieces and animatronics. Spider-Man, however, is able to provide an experience at a faster pace, having it feel more action-packed, and all subsequent screen-based attractions have seemed to take the wrong lesson from this. For example, Transformers, while not a bad attraction, suffers from being so poorly paced that it's difficult to even understand what's going on the first few times around. So much is happening at once that characters in the narrative are just screaming out the names of the other Transformers as they appear because there's no time to even process the action. It's Rabbit! He's after the Allspark! This is a pretty significant issue with the other screen-based attractions as well, even if Gringotts and Skull Island are somewhat better paced. If you've been on Fast and Furious, the pacing is so comically fast, the action is just incomprehensible. I know that the video is focused on the faults of Universal, but it's difficult not to make comparisons to Disney when this is exactly the type of attraction that they've been emulating. I've continued to tear down Runaway Railway for its poor pacing over the library of videos I produce, so I wouldn't be surprised if you thought of this first. However, one of the largest offenders is actually Rise of the Resistance, and while its pacing isn't to the same speed as, say, Transformers, it still suffers from the same issues, not really giving you enough time to process the action. In my opinion, a few high-paced attractions are fine here and there in a the park, but I believe that theme parks are strongest when they focus on atmosphere. I want more Dream Flights, more Pirates of the Caribbean, and more E.T. When parks become oversaturated with action-based narratives, it just becomes tedious and the attractions begin to blend together. To be fair, I haven't been nearly as critical of Universal because they seem to have recognized that they're receiving a lot of negative feedback from this. Hagrid's, for example, is a masterpiece in pacing, especially for a roller coaster, understanding when to slow down the speed of the coaster or want to make an effect simple but impactful enough to not be missed when the train is speeding by. The return to physicality and slower pacing is reflected in a slate of other new attractions that Universal has recently premiered over the last few years, 
indicating a more positive and refreshing turn for attraction design from the company. This includes the new Jurassic World retheme for the splashdown at Universal Hollywood, or the new Secret Life of Pets ride that premiered there as well. Ultimately, I don't think that screen-based attractions are a huge issue in and of themselves, though. Let me summarize my points on this clearly. First, it is definitely true that screen-based rides do lack the atmosphere of physical sets and animatronics, but the largest issue at Universal Studios Florida is just bad attraction design in general, with Shrek and Simpsons not being particularly good and Fast and Furious carrying the reputation as one of the worst attractions ever created. Second, I believe that people often find screen-based attractions to be unfulfilling experiences, but because of the narrative and pacing issues that often occur. This is why Spider-Man continues to be one of the best attractions that Universal offers, because it just simply tells its story better and utilizes unique effects that make it memorable. People often think that the issue is the screens, when really it's the execution of the narrative. Last, the issue with the oversaturation of screens is on its way out, as Universal has clearly recognized the guests desire more ambitious, physical attractions. When you think of Universal, especially in Orlando, you probably think of the immersive nature of the parks. I don't need to tell you that Hogsmeade, Diagon Alley, or the various attractions housed within are fantastic. It's also a given that anything new to these parks will receive a lot of attention and the best of maintenance standards. Even an aging land like Marvel Superhero Island, due to its popularity, has received pretty significant updates. For example, in 2012, Spider-Man received new digital projectors and updated its projected content to HD. The Incredible Hulk closed down in 2015 and reopened a year later, this time with a refurbished queue, new trains, and it was completely retracked, offering an expensive but major refresh to a fan-favorite experience. However, outside of the major draws to Universal Parks, many areas just feel... neglected. For example, when the Wizarding World of Harry Potter took over the Merlinwood section of the Lost Continent, it very much dampened the impact of the overall land. Dueling Dragons and Flying Unicorn were incorporated into the new Potter theme, but without any rides, this part of the park now felt empty. The Lost City portion still features the excellent theming of the Mythos restaurant and the walkthrough show Poseidon's Fury, but that in itself has become quite dated. Poseidon's Fury closed in the summer of 2020, listing the reason for its closure as a cost-saving measure in the middle of, well, you know. But its new work walls seem to indicate that it's undergoing a major refurbishment before it reopens. I enjoy this campy attraction for what it is, but I can't deny that this part of the park feels stale and neglected. The other remaining portion of the Lost Continent is Sinbad's Bazaar, and again, while I like the theming, it just feels a bit empty and pointless. It consists mostly of shops and quick-service dining locations, with the theater hosting the 8th Voyage of Sinbad just sitting empty since 2018. Granted, the show wasn't very good, but it only really exists now as an extended queue for Hagrid's when the line gets out of control. It's an area of the park I would very much like to see revitalized, but I just don't think that it will happen. If we move across to Toon Lagoon though, this is another area that contains a lot of excellent theming, but because it's not a major draw, it seems to be neglected. Wandering around, I was surprised by how much this area actually offers. First, if you walk down the main alleyway of shops, the various comic strips referenced is actually really fun to look at, offering a number of interesting kinetic elements and featuring vintage characters that are obscure to contemporary audiences. However, the more I looked, the more I appreciated the depth of theming that this area offered, especially when I used to just consider it rather tacky. Another really clever element is that you could consider this strip of stores a comic strip, which is an interesting pun, very much in the spirit of the newspaper comics that the area is paying tribute to. It's incredibly meta, but when I first noticed it, I realized how clever it was. Other than shopping and quick service dining though, Toon Lagoon offers two major attractions. The first is Dudley Do-Right's Ripsaw Falls, which is an excellently themed log flume ride featuring of course Dudley Do-Right. It's certainly not the best log flume attraction out there, as I consider Splash Mountain to be far superior, but it's fun for what it is. 
The other attraction is Popeye and Bluto's Billage Rat Barges, of course, themed to Popeye. If you were a casual park goer, you might not even know that this attraction was here unless you wandered in the right direction, but it's easily the best themed river raft ride I've ever experienced. It weaves in and out of a more obscure area of the park down by the lagoon called Sweet Haven, and it really is an underrated experience. Not only is it less crowded because people don't really know it's there, but this pretty large area full of winding pathways offers great views of the park from the lagoon, and is actually quite rewarding if you choose to explore it. It's full of hidden gags and details that keep revealing themselves the more you explore. There is very much a dedicated fan base interested in exploring the details hidden around the Disney parks, but people oftentimes fail to realize that Universal offers that same type of experience. I went from not really caring about Toon Lagoon to realizing how interesting and well-themed it was, but it seems to suffer from the same neglect and lack of maintenance standards that afflicts the Lost Continent, simply because it's not a major draw to the park. Many effects on the attractions rarely work, if at all, and it's a noticeable difference from the more visited areas of the park. One last underrated land of islands is, of course, Seuss Landing. Like Toon Lagoon, Seuss offers a ton of hidden details if you take the time to look for them, with the land itself acting as a love letter to the source material. As you walk through, you'll notice that there are no straight lines anywhere, and that even the trees are grown and manicured in such a way as to reflect the art style of the books. Dr. Seuss himself is hidden in plain sight from the many people who walk past every day, not even knowing what he looks like. In Dr. Seuss's The Sneetches and Other Stories, there's one tale about the two Zaxes. One only goes north, and the other only goes south, and when they meet each other, they reach an impasse because of their stubbornness. Seuss Landing actually features an adaptation of this called the Zax Bypass, where two Zaxes have met and have stubbornly refused to move out of each other's way, resulting in the land and even the support structure for the Sky Trolley being built around them. It's a clever detail that you would miss if you didn't take the time to pay attention to it, but Seuss is absolutely full of things like this. Another favorite of mine is McElligot's Pool, where if you throw a coin into the mouth of a fish, it will retaliate by squirting you in the face with water. I doubt most people are even aware that this feature even exists. However, Seuss Landing offers five major attractions. The first is an interactive kids area called If I Ran the Zoo, which is adjacent to the Karasu cell, offering a number of rideable creatures popular in the literature. Next is One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish, a spinner attraction that has the fish squirting you with water if you don't raise and lower the vehicles in sync with the instructions of the song. There is also the High in the Sky Seuss Trolley Train Ride, which, in my opinion, is highly underrated. It's simply an elevated powered coaster, and yes, it is technically a roller coaster, that takes you through a guided tour of Seuss Landing, offering spectacular views of the park and sending you through a number of brief but interesting show scenes. Some are outside and some indoors, even one side of the track bringing you through Circus McGurkis, adding a bit of kinetic energy to the main quick service location for the land. Of course, I couldn't forget the Cat in the Hat, which is one of my favorite dark rides. Often bypassed because people think it's for kids, this charming but ambitious little attraction reminds me quite a bit of the many classic Fantasyland dark rides that reside in Disneyland. Offering a lot of heavily detailed scenes and clever effects, it's a great attraction but it never has a weight, even on the busiest of days because people just keep walking on by. That really is the story of Seuss Landing though. People perceive it as just some kid's area, not taking the time to appreciate the plentiful details, the interesting architecture, and the often underrated but charming attractions. Like Toon Lagoon, this area of the park suffers from the same issues, with chipping paint everywhere, and many of the show effects on the rides just simply exist in a state of disrepair. If you walked through If I Ran the Zoo, you'll find that almost none of the interactive elements even seem to work here anymore. This is something that I've noticed with the other interactive areas of the park, including Me Ship the Olive in Toon Lagoon, and Camp Jurassic, obviously located in Jurassic Park. Going through, I even noticed visible construction going on, which hopefully is a good sign for this area, though. 
Moving away from islands into the studios though, there aren't really any neglected areas other than Kid Zone. I have very little interest in Universal revitalizing this area, because it simply lacks the theming and depth of the other neglected areas over in Islands. It features mostly kids' playgrounds with Fievel's Playland, a closed Curious George interactive water play area, and Woody Woodpecker's Nuthouse Coaster. Another cost-cutting casualty, A Day in the Park with Barney ended in 2020, and the building is now used to offer meet and greets for DreamWorks characters with what appears to be a very temporary setup. I'm not particularly concerned with the upkeep of Kid Zone because if I had to speculate, I would say it's next on the chopping block after Shrek 4D. It sits on quite a large amount of land that could definitely be better utilized, and I wouldn't be surprised if this is where the next major expansion for the park takes place. However, there is one last major issue to talk about here, and that's the state of the E.T. adventure. An absolute classic that defined early Universal Studios Florida, it's the last remaining opening day attraction and it's in a complete state of disrepair. That's a shame, because like the Cat in the Hat, it's a strange but charming ride that excels with atmosphere, and seems like a genuine artistic effort from Steven Spielberg. Even with the removal of social distancing, the attraction has yet to funnel guests in to watch the pre-show, opting instead to have everyone move directly through the queue, missing essential setup. If you weren't aware, the E.T. adventure is a passion project of Spielberg's, working as a sequel to his film by first having you escape with E.T. through the woods and bringing him back to his dying home planet. The second half of the attraction is a bit of a strange acid trip, but ultimately a unique style that I believe is often overlooked. However, the sad state of the ride is visibly apparent to anyone riding. Over the last few years, various effects and the capabilities of the animatronics have continued to degrade quite rapidly, resulting in, well, a mess of an experience. As the last remaining iconic attraction of the classic Universal Studios, it really is something that I wish was shown some love. However, as I believe I've illustrated, Universal does seem to just neglect certain areas of its parks when they're not new or themed to Harry Potter, which, as a theme park fan, is incredibly disappointing to me. I certainly understand why they don't devote their budgets here, but I would really like to see these areas revitalized someday. I've heard the rumor that the original plans for Seuss Landing might have included a Mount Crumpet roller coaster themed to the Grinch, which seems like the perfect excuse to revitalize Seuss and make him more relevant again. Simply put though, certain areas of these parks really do suffer from neglect, and people definitely notice that. Hopefully, when it's time to make the next major investment into these parks, certain attractions and lands will get the same treatment that Superhero Island did with Spider-Man and Hulk. I've covered some pretty serious issues holding back the Universal Parks, whether it be the over-reliance on screen-based attractions, or the many neglected areas that really need some money poured their way. However, I do have a number of smaller, miscellaneous criticisms that I would like to express. First is the food quality. Disney has Universal beat hands down in this area, even if they themselves do have some awful places. Universal Parks do have good food if you know where to look, but it can very often be a minefield. The Leaky Cauldron and the Three Broomsticks in the Wizarding World do serve pretty decent British food if you're looking for quick service options. Even the in-park sit-down restaurants like Mythos at Islands or Lombard's at the Studios can be really good. But you should also be careful. The studio seems to be slowly improving its food options, but there's just something about the outdated locations at Islands that I'm going to recommend you avoid. Any place that has tiles from 1999 still on the wall of their kitchen is someplace that you should not be going. Comic Strip Cafe? Easily one of the worst meals I've ever had in my life, and I'm not being hyperbolic. In most cases, you'll actually find better food at the Burger King and City Walk than you will in the parks, and that is a genuine recommendation. In fact, CityWalk offers a number of pretty decent dining locations, with my favorite being Cowfish. With that being said though, if you must eat in the parks, I would recommend spending just a little bit more for their sit-down options. Why eat cardboard pizza at Circus McGurkis when you could spend a few dollars more and get a good meal at Mythos? Sorry, but Universal could really improve in this regard. Moving on, I've criticized New Disney for its lack of care with sightlines, 
but one of the worst transgressors is Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey. The show building is not only easily visible from numerous areas around Hogsmeade, but from Jurassic Park as well. Worse still, an egress route from the queue leads directly into Jurassic Park, not only mixing coniferous trees with jungle vegetation, but if you stand in the right place, you can actually hear John Williams dueling himself with clashing soundtracks. It baffles me that something as simple as a themed wall was never put into place to fix this issue. A while ago, in my Fall of Disney Parks videos, I did make the point that Universal Hotels offer much better perks and amenities, and for cheaper, than the outrageously priced Disney options. One important point to note is that if you stay in any of their premier hotels, which will be Portofino Bay, Royal Pacific, or the Hard Rock, you will receive passes for Unlimited Express as a major perk. However, I think I know why these three hotels offer Universal Express as an incentive. It's definitely not because these are really premier hotels. The Hard Rock is probably the best, if not a little bit gimmicky, but the Royal Pacific is in desperate need of interior refurbishments. The carpet throughout the hallways has a design not unlike spilled vomit, and the rooms are unpleasantly tacky. Genuinely though, the lobby does look great. Universal's most prestigious hotel, Portofino Bay, looks great until you get up close to the architecture and realize that all the detailing is just cheaply painted on. For trying to sell you on the atmosphere and theming of an Italian Mediterranean town, this absolutely just ruins it and leaves the experience feeling like you're on the facade of a movie set. These so-called premier hotels only get that designation because they're arguably the least desirable of the Universal hotels on theming and atmosphere alone. I greatly prefer the lower tier hotels, especially Sapphire Falls. Just a few more notes before I wrap up, but Volcano Bay is definitely one of the coolest water parks I've ever been to. That being said, it's far too small and reaches capacity far too often, and so it's in desperate need of expansion. Looking at the plot of land it sits on, it could conceivably expand quite a bit, which hopefully happens in the future. Transitioning to the studios, Hollywood Rip Ride Rocket is... well... Probably the worst roller coaster in all of Orlando. Especially when Islands has such a solid lineup with Hagrid's, Hulk, and Velocicoaster, Rip Ride Rocket is just an unpleasant, uncomfortable mess that has always felt like a ripoff of Rock and Roller Coaster. Its bold color scheme and vertical lift hill looks great for the skyline of the park, but don't let that fool you into thinking it's a good experience. Finally, I've arrived at my last point, in that I absolutely hate the inclusion of The Simpsons in this same park. I've never really watched the show, and I've heard that a good chunk of its early seasons are pretty good, but the animation style is incredibly off-putting to me. When The Simpsons ride, which was never really great to begin with, expanded into Springfield as a whole land, it created a visual blight on the park. Stylistically, it clashes with everything else and feels incredibly tacky. For fans of the show, the various restaurant facades along the midway might seem to be inviting, and when you step into Moe's, you do actually get a faithful recreation of the bar. However, the other various facades lead into a rethemed food court, which ultimately feels cheap and disappointing. With that being said though, I think I'm in the minority with disliking the inclusion of The Simpsons in the park. I see that the food, beer, and merchandise sells really well, and so because of that, it's likely not going to be leaving the park anytime soon even if Disney now owns the property with their acquisition of Fox. So, these have been my many criticisms of Universal Parks, or at the very least, the Florida Resort, where they should be the strongest. If you've been watching my videos, you've seen me posit that Disney is at a critical point, where they may lose a large degree of market share to Universal Parks if the quality of their new attractions and overall experience continues to decline. I believe that this is a strong prediction, considering that Universal is already in the first stages of constructing Epic Universe, likely making it a far stronger competitor to Disney in the Orlando market when it opens. However, as I've highlighted, I do think that there are a number of other significant factors that are currently holding these parks back. It's easy for guests to be impressed with the theming of the Wizarding World, or the thrill of the Velocicoaster, but the peeling paint of Toon Lagoon, or the various elements not working around Seuss Landing, leave an impression as well. Even though Universal seems to be moving away from this, the over-reliance on screen-based experiences is still quite detrimental, but at the very least we have a reason to feel optimistic about the parks moving in a different direction. 
finally, there are a number of other smaller issues, which, while not deal breakers in and of themselves, can add up and make a competitive difference. As you can see, I criticize Universal Parks just as I criticize Disney, not wanting to see them fail, but wanting to see them improve. The sad state of the many lands and attractions around these parks overshadows the effort and creativity contained within them. This is something that I feel often goes underappreciated and that you should definitely take the time to explore the next time you go. With all this being said though, I am somewhat curious if people agree or disagree with what I've been saying. Should Universal Park budgets go towards revitalizing lands like Seuss Landing? Is the issue with screen-based attractions not necessarily the screens themselves, but the narrative and pacing? Am I wrong in disliking Springfield and should it stay? As always, you can help the channel out by simply leaving a like on the video and subscribe with bell notification to be alerted when new videos are released.